the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man, and I'm here to read the funnies to you happy boys and honeys. Yes, boys and girls, it's Comic Weekly time, and here I come right into your house to bring a little fun and happiness. Right out of the pages of Puck the Comic Weekly, straight into your living room, your friend, the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. Hello, hello, hello. Hello, hello, hello. Well, little Miss Honey, how are you today? I'm doing just wonderful. Are you still keeping your New Year's resolutions? Yes, I think so. I'm still doing all the things I said I would do better, but I almost slipped once. Oh, how's that? Well, I found out where my mother kept the candy that she got for Christmas, so I was going to take it to but I remember just in time, and I didn't. Was it hard to put the box back without eating a piece? Yes, it was. But I promised myself I wasn't going to take anything unless I asked. So I didn't. So I asked instead. And did your mother give you the candy? Yes. She gave me two pieces. Only one to eat then, not to spoil my appetite, and one to eat later after I'd eaten, you know, whenever I wanted to. Well, that just shows, doesn't it, that honesty is sometimes rewarded. Yes, it does. And now I'm going to reward you by reading the funnies. Thank you. You're welcome. So here we go with Puck the Comic Weekly. But before I do, let's listen to this nice man. Now here we go with Puck the Comic Weekly. And on the first page, hop along Cassidy. Magic words for the music, here we go. Six guns blazing as he thunders along. Give us music for Hop Along. Hoppy and his pals, California and Lucky, have discovered a herd of cattle in a canyon. And then they come upon one of the herds that have wandered out of the canyon. They notice that the brand on the stray has been freshly changed from a quarter circle Y to a circle M. California exclaims, Hey, it looks like a clear case of rustling. Well, what are we going to do about it, Hoppy? Last picture, second row, Hoppy mounts Topper and says, Let's move in on that herd. First picture, bottom row, they ride right into the canyon on the lookout for the lustrous. Hoppy says, It appears like the cattle were driven into that box canyon. California replies, Hey, then we got them rustlers cornered. But as they ride through the herd, not a sign can be seen of the rustlers. Lucky says, I guess they skipped. California exclaims, Well, and we got this stolen beef all to ourselves. But last picture, behind the cattle, at the end of the canyon, waiting for Hoppy and his pals to come closer, are three rustlers, guns in hand. It looks that way. Oh, I wish Hoppy would turn around and go back. I'm afraid they'll shoot him dead. Oh, I hope not. But we'll find that out next week. Now? Oh, now let's turn over to page three because I'm sure this is where we'll find Prince Valiant. Very well. Over the page we go. Uh, yes, there he is. Yes, there he is on his boat at sea with his father, King Aguar. And the battle of the, with the Danes is over. Yes, because Boltar, who's a wonderful fighter, came at the time when things looked bad for them. Yes, and he came even though he defied the king's orders before and knew that the king might punish him. Yes, but another reason he came was because King Agua had made little Arn the captain in Boltar's place. And Tillicum, Arn's nurse, had come along too, and Boltar loved Tillicum. Yes, that was, uh, that was Alita's idea. She hoped that Boltar would come to rescue Tillicum, and the idea worked. Yes, now let's see whether King Edward punishes Boltar or his master. Very well, here we go with Prince Valiant in the days of King Arthur. Hecket, Breckett, Grey Malkin, and Quince. Music romantic for a fair, fair prince. <laughs> Second picture, Boltar stands defiantly before his king. There's anger in his eyes and a great love in his heart. A love for his king, just in peace, mighty in battle. The only man he'd ever acknowledge as his captain. Last picture, top row, King Aguar says, Well, old grumbler, 
Why did you return when your new punishment awaited you? First picture, next row, Bolshar replies. Because you did not know how strong the Danes had become. And how, and how they have planned revenge for, for, for years. Well, you, you invited defeat when you, when, you, when you put a child in my place. And then he steals a glance at Tillicum and says, and, and you placed a woman in danger. Last picture, second row. King Aguar says thoughtfully, Hmm. Well, after the hardy way you fought, they can hardly have you hung, as I intended. Instead, you will be imprisoned for life. Unless there is someone who will stand responsible for your future conduct. First picture, bottom row, Tillicum stands to Boltar's side and says, My life and body will be his bond. For a moment, Boltar stares at the woman he thought he had lost. And then, with a roar, his pent-up emotions explode. No, Tillicum! He clasped her in his arms with a roar of happiness. <laughs> Tillicum struggles free, and she places a firm brown hand in her future husband's great paw, stating to King Aguar that Boltar never again will defy the king's laws. And as the king looks into her fierce, dark eyes, the king is sure he won't. Yes, and he's been rewarded in a very nice way. Yes, at last Tillicum's going to marry him. Isn't that wonderful? Yes, isn't that wonderful? And next week we'll see the beginning of Boltar and Tillicum's new life. But now let's turn over the page. Oh, look, there's Flash Gordon on page five. And I'm anxious to read this because Flash is on the planet Mars. Yes, and he had saved the city where Queen Menta lives from being destroyed by a hurricane. And the city was being flooded. And Flash dived out of the airship he was in under the water to put a bomb there. That's right. And the bomb was to explode at a certain spot and blast open a channel for the waters to escape so that the city wouldn't be flooded. And when the flood came up again, Queen Menta wouldn't wait for him to get in the ship but began to sail away so she'll be safe. And I'm so afraid that Flash will be killed when the explosion goes off. Well, let's read now and see if Flash can find a way to save himself. Here we go with Flash Gordon. Rega rega doon doon, saskimatash. Let's have music for heroic flag. <laughs> Emerging from the floodwaters after planting the time bomb that'll blast out a new channel and save the Martian city, Flash is dismayed to find that Queen Menta has cold-bloodedly ordered her scout ship to abandon him to his fate. Inside the scout ship, Dale and Link plead with Queen Menta to turn back. Link begs, the time bomb will go off any moment. You gotta save Flash. But the cruel Menta calmly aims a rocket pistol at Link, pulls the trigger, paralyzing him with a neutral beam, while the pilot holds Dale. Last picture, top row. Incredulous, Flash watches as his hope of rescue fades away. The scout ship speeds off into the sky. But perilous as his own flight is, Flash is even more fearful for Dale, and he mutters, he's completely in the power of that ruthless woman. And first picture, bottom row. Making an almost hopeless attempt to save himself, Flash dives into the icy canal and gropes blindly in the murky waters, seeking the time bomb. His only chance is to shut off the fuse, and there are but seconds left. But Flash's panicky underwater search is in vain. Last picture with a tremendous roar. The hydrocarbon bomb blows out the levee, spewing dirt and water high in the Martian skies. And even the fleeing scout ship is rocked by the mighty air blast. Oh, he didn't make it in time. And look at all those things flying in the air because of the explosion. Yes. My, that explosion can even make momentous rocket ship bounce around way up in the air. Well, how can Flash's ship when he's right down in the water? Oh, 
Flash has been in some mighty dangerous spots, but none of them as bad as this. Do you think he will escape? Well, we'll find that out next week. But now let's turn over the page and see what we'll see. All right. Well, here's Jungle Jim and the Lone Ranger. Oh, and here's Donald Duck. You know what to do. And I'll do it right away. Here we go with Donald Duck. And say the magic words with me. Squeeze jump, jump, squeeze 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 jump
three French-Canadian trappers approach. They stop beside the Indians. In their faces, Dick sees fierce jealousy. First picture, second row. One of them says to Captain Lewis, Ah, you come first. Then your armies will come next. Dick realizes the trappers will say anything to destroy the chances of the Americans to deal with the Indians. And the trapper is successful, for suddenly, LeBorn utters a war cry. Hello! And the blockhouse swarms with armed warriors. At this instant, a young Indian woman rushes in. First picture, bottom row. Dick can hardly believe his eyes. Neither Lewis nor Clark nor Dick nor anyone else has ever seen this young squaw before. And yet she cries, Behold, LeBorn, these are my brothers. Hearken, LeBorn, these men are my friends. And Dick hears a mysterious click on his wrist. And then the woman quickly bears his arm and says, See the sacred tokens they wear, given to them by my tribe. In silence, LeBorn looks at the bracelets the Indian maid had secretly slipped on Dick and Lewis and Clark's wrists. Dick wonders, will the trick work? And then, LeBorn nods his head. He beckons to his tribe, and they go away in peace. Last picture, alone at last. Lewis and Clark and Dick stare in bewilderment. Who is this woman? Oh, my. I wonder who she is, too. Well, it was wonderful that she came at the last minute. Yes, it was wonderful because she saved them. Those trappers were mean men telling lies like that to make the Indians hate the Americans. Yes, they were. And I'll bet you'd like to know why. Why? Well, the trappers don't want the Americans to be friends with the Indians because, you see, the trappers would buy skins from the Indians, besides trapping uh, furs themselves, you see, and they would buy these skins, which are expensive furs, from the Indians for just a few beads, and these beads would only cost a few cents. And then they would sell these skins for a lot of money to people in the cities back east. Well, that was very selfish of them. I bet it was. And you see, that's why they don't want honest men like Dick and Lewis and Clark around, you see? Oh, because I... they might tell the Indians the furs are, are, are worth more money. Oh, I well, maybe next week we'll find out who the Indian maid is. Now, let's look underneath. Here's oh. Rusty Riley. Oh, yes. And do you remember uh, at the Milestone Farm, uh, Rusty and Pete uh, saw, saw that Englishman named Nobbs coming out of the window? Yes, and this is the man who's pretending to be friendly to Mr. Miles. And he's stolen the trophies from Mr. Miles' safe. And he's done this while Sir Percival is at the country club having dinner with Mr. Miles. Oh, I hope Nobbs doesn't see the boys, though, or he might hurt them. Yes. Well, let's read right now and see what happens. Here we go with Rusty Riley. Gallop and run till the road is dusty. Give us music for his horse and Rusty. Miles has told Pete that he mustn't drive his car because he's too young to have a license. But Rusty and Pete decide it's better to go against Mr. Miles' wishes than to let Nobbs get away. So last picture, top row, they get the car out of the garage and roll it slowly, quietly down the driveway. They see Nobbs getting into a taxi a short distance down the road. Pete exclaims, Hey, golly, Rusty, that's funny. He hasn't got Sir Percival's car. He's taking a taxi. First picture, bottom row. They follow the taxi that Nobbs has taken. Pete says, Hey, hey, look. The taxi's turning in at the country club. Hey, didn't Mr. Miles take Sir Percival there for dinner? They decide to pull in to the side of the road and to wait in the shade of some trees. A short while later, they see a car come out of the country club drive. The car comes toward them and then passes. From behind the tree, Rusty exclaims, Hey, there's Sir Percival's car, Pete. And Pete replies, Yeah, and only Sir Percival and his man Nobbs are in it, not Mr. Miles. And in the car, Sir Percival says to Nobbs, Well, head for a safe place to stash the loot, Nobbs. Not too far now. 
We must return this hired car. We don't want the cops picking us up for driving a hot car. Later, in Mr. Miles' study, when he returns from the country club, he sees his wall safe broken open. He exclaims, last picture, Good gracious, what on earth has happened here? Why, there's been a burglary. Oh, my, those men got away, didn't they? It certainly looks that way. Oh, oh, unless, unless Rusty and Pete trail them and see where they hide the trophies that they stole. Well, I hope they do. And then they, they could bring them back to Mr. Miles and they would be heroes. Yes, let's hope it works out that way so they could be heroes. And now it's time for Dagwood and Blondie. And here they are on the first page, second section. And here we go on the first page, second section with Dagwood and Blondie. Ram of food, ram of fum, zim zam zombie. Conjimmy music for Dagwood and Blondie. <laughs> Bondi is telling Dagwood. I'm taking the children to a piano recital. You may have the evening off, dear. Really? Sure. Have a nice supper in a restaurant and then have some fun with the boys. Honestly? Yes. Goodbye, dear. Goodbye. Bondi and the children go out the door. And in a second, last picture, top row, Dagwood's upstairs in the bathroom shaving. And he says, Oh, boy, how wonderful. A night out. I feel as free as the breeze. Now, let me see. What can I do that'll be real exciting? First picture next row, he's at Herb Woodley's house, all dressed up for a night out. And he says, Hey, um, I'm on my own. I'm, I'm, I'm on my own tonight, Herb. Come on, we'll do the town, huh? And Herb replies, Hey, Jay, that sounds good. Wait till I ask my wife. When Herb's wife whooshes in, and she grabs Herb by the ear and says, Dagwood Bumstead, you get out of here and stop putting ideas into my Herbert's head. <laughs> Last picture, second row, Dagwood is at another's friend's house. Hey, hi there, Gus. Uh, how about getting the boys together for a little game tonight, huh? Yeah, good. Come on in. We'll phone them. First picture, third row, Gus's wife appears in the door. <laughs> no, you don't. You go about your business and let my husband alone. Hey! Dagwood goes down the street saying, Oh, well, <laughs> there's always a nice bunch of single fellows in the bowling alley. That'll make a nice evening. Last picture, third row, as Dagwood comes into the bowling alley, the attendant says, No bowling tonight, Dagwood. The alleys have been rented by a private club. None of your friends are around. Oh, well, uh... All right, I'll go over to the pool parlor. They're probably over there. First picture bottom row at the pool room. Dagwood's told, uh, the pool room's closed tonight for repairs. Uh, open tomorrow. Oh, well, well, I'll go to a nice restaurant and, and I'll have a good supper and maybe something will turn up. <laughs> As Dagwood comes into the restaurant, he sees Mr. Dithers, and he exclaims, Oh, oh, the boss. And he's about to sneak out when Mr. Dithers shouts, Dagwood, dear boy, how good to see you. I'm working at the office tonight, and you can help me. And last picture, Dagwood's at the office, slaving over a hot desk. Mr. Dithers comes in with another stack of papers and plops them on the desk and says, and here are some more, Dagwood, when you finish those. And Dagwood groans. Oh, my first night out in a year. Oh, <laughs> oh poor Dagwood. Poor Dagwood. He has to work instead of having fun. Yes, what a disappointment. Yes, that wasn't fair. No, it wasn't. It's a shame the other wives were not as nice as Blondie was. Yes, but you see, some women won't let their husbands go out alone. Maybe it's because they're afraid that they'll get lost and not come home dragging their tails behind them like little Bo Peep sheep. Well, now look at the bottom of the page. There's Roy Rogers. Oh, yes, and you remember last week, uh, Roy and Dolfo Hawkins had gone to the ranch where the cattle rustlers were, and they pretended to be two of the rustlers. And they were pretending to be Dude Dawson and Rocky Hill. And while they were there, the real rustlers, Dude Dawson and Rocky Hill, came to the ranch. Oh. I know that Roy's going to be in trouble now because they're surrounded by bad men. I wonder what'll happen to him. Well, let's read now and find out. Here we go with Roy Rogers, King of the Cowboys. A yip pi Now here we go with Roy and Trigger. A yip pi Roy 
Roy hears Rocky Hill say to Mr. Meeker, Yeah, those hombres are Dolphal Hawkins, the train guard, and his pal Roy Rogers. Quickly, Roy and Dolphal run toward a couple of the rustlers. Last picture top row, they grab up the rustlers' rifles and say, Hey, those two lawmen with the boss, they're after us. The bewildered rustlers watch as Roy and Dolphal run for a shack and lock themselves in. And they are safe for a moment. But only for a moment. For first picture bottom row, Meeker, leader of the rustlers, says, Dude, keep them in that shack. You others, open the corrals and stampede the stairs toward the shack. I'll fix them for trying to hoodwink Judson Meeker. As the shots rip through the shack, Dolphal says, We can't get out of this blasted shack, Roy. We're trapped. Roy exclaims, Hey, great guns. They're stampeding the herd this way. Last picture, the cattle head straight for the shack. Into it they run, and over it, rushing it to the ground. Oh, look, the cattle ran right over the shack and they crushed it to pieces. How will Roy come out alive? Well, that's something I don't know. Maybe we'll find that out, though, next week. Now, that's all the time I have. But before I go, here's that nice fellow with some more interesting information. Well, honey, and all you boys and girls, I gotta go now. All right, Mr. Tommy Gleagly Man, but I'll be waiting for you next week. Okay, that's a date, and a date with all you boys and girls. Be sure to meet me with our little friend, Miss Honey, next week when I read Puck the Comic Weekly. For I'm the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. I'll be back to read the funnies to you happy boys and honey. Don't forget, boys and girls, see you all next week. Your friend, the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man.